If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to find Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We are into our last few weeks in the book of Acts. Uh, hopefully this summer has helped you have a, uh, a greater understanding of the early church and the way that Jesus has called us uh, to live. He's called us to a different way of living. All right, and I've, I've really enjoyed going through the book, and I've been challenged in quite a few areas uh, for myself to reevaluate what my focus is, how I'm living, uh, and try and put this in a better place where, where I can better focus on the mission that Jesus has called me to. All right, today's the last portion of the book that we are going to look at before Paul basically starts moving into what I'll even call kind of the end game. He's moving back towards Jerusalem. Uh, and then on to Rome. So this is kind of the last part that we're going to pull out as a story. But there, there are a lot of chapters here of Paul uh, going around, Paul, Barnabas, Paul, Silas, uh, doing different things. And I want to encourage you, be reading through that. Um, it, it, there's just so much there for us to be taking out of that. So uh, let's just put ourselves in a spot where we are excited to be together, uh, where we are expecting that God has something for us today, because I know that he does. All right, last week we finished the scene with all these people in Ephesus coming together uh, and burning all of these scrolls and books that they had for spells. Okay, and that, that's how we ended. Uh, and it was actually about, in today's terms, it was about 11 and a quarter million dollars worth of stuff that they gathered in this one city and burned. Okay? Uh, imagine having that much of a city's value disappear in a moment. Okay, and so one commentator, what they said as, as I'm reading through this, he just said, when the gospel begins to have a financial impact, trouble will be just around the corner. All right, and so that's, that's what we're looking at today. If you are able, if you're willing, would you stand with me? Uh, I'm going to read through our passage. We are in Acts chapter 19. We are going to start in verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and in, uh, and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius, and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, uh, of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls that can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. God, we pray this morning as we, we dive into this uh, story of Paul, Lord, that we, we would be challenged in a new way. 
God, that you would remind us of things, maybe that you have said before to us, things that we maybe already know. But God, I pray that we would just be open and sensitive to what it is that you are speaking to us today. Lord, we ask that in your name. Amen. All right, so you guys can have a seat. So this issue that we see in today's passage, this is far from the first time uh, that we've seen something like this, okay, uh, which is basically a clash between culture and the Christian way of living. And I want to make this clear, uh, this is a clash between culture and the way that Christians are living, not Christians themselves. And that may sound redundant, but I think that's actually an important distinction for us to make. All right, the, the one today is specifically over the fact that the new way of living was hurting the surrounding society financially. And we saw something similar back in Acts 16, uh, a, a story that we had kind of passed over, when a girl who was possessed by an evil spirit, she was following Paul and Silas around, and she kept shouting things as she followed them. She was shouting things, uh, basically kind of saying, like, these men are the servants of the God Most High. And they are telling you the way to be saved. It's a weird picture. Like, you, you'd think that, that she'd be trying to lie about it and discredit them, but, but this evil spirit's following, following them around, uh, and it's this interesting interaction to begin with. And Paul doesn't do anything about it, uh, doesn't do anything about the fact that the girl has an evil spirit, uh, basically. And now, before this story, Luke tells us that this girl, she was a fortune teller, and that she made a lot of money for her master. She was a slave, and she made money for them, all right? Uh, and well, she kept following them for many days doing this. Finally, Paul becomes so annoyed with her that he turns around and he casts out the spirit because he was annoyed. <laughs> it's kind of this weird spot where you're like, I, I feel like you should have done it for other reasons. Maybe you should have done it sooner. But he, he gets annoyed with her, turns around, casts the spirit out. Uh, now her masters can't make money the way that they used to make by her telling fortunes. They get upset, and Paul and Silas end up being arrested and thrown in prison. All right, when the gospel starts to negatively impact the way of life in the people around you, you will get pushback, especially when it has to do with finances. All right? Uh, everyone in the world has a way of living their life. Everyone in our world right now. Sometimes their life is guided by something external, like religion or politics or some shared ideology that people have. Like, most people have some type of guiding, we'll call it compass, okay? For us, we believe this is the Holy Spirit, that this is God that is guiding us. Uh, sometimes people are guided by more of like family tradition. Sometimes they choose to live their life just based off of uh, whatever they think or feel, right? Like kind of the idea of like, you do you or just do what makes you happy, uh, you know, kind of march to the beat of your own drum, like that type of idea. Now, there's always been discussion around this idea of uh, United States and, and whether or not our country was a Christian nation. Okay? And, and stick with me here. I, this may sound like I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but, but stick with me here. Uh, now, when I've dug it into the wording of, of some of these things surrounding the Constitution, it actually seems like uh, the, founding, the founding fathers were trying to make sure uh, that there actually just wouldn't be one specific religious belief that would rule the nation. Because even when they came across, uh, they, they were broken into different Christian denominations. And there was actually a lot of arguing between them. And they didn't want the government to have one spe specific one uh, that would be leading them. And saying, like, this is how you have to live. This is how you have to do things. So when they came, they actually put in there that there was no religious test that you could basically force politicians to go through. And now this was, this was hard because there were actually some states that had this set up. And they had it set up so that only, like, a Protestant or a Christian could be um, kind of leading them and part of the government. And so the, the, the uh, Constitution comes down and says, okay... We actually aren't going to do that. We're not going to have anything like that in there. And, you know, it, it makes sense because the reality is, like, can, can a nation truly be Christian? When we talk about what, what is a Christian, like, you know, I, I'm a Christian because I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've committed everything. I've given my allegiance to him. Um, and, and I think that, that saying a Christian nation you know, using Christian as an adjective is just kind of a weird thing. You know, we say like Christian music or Christian 
uh, radio, Christian movies, Christian, and we use it as an adjective. And I think that we've kind of done a disservice in some of this. Instead, what paints a better picture of what the founding fathers and our country as a whole was, they, they had agreed upon a moral and ethical code that people would kind of live their lives by. And I think that when we say that we are a Christian nation, that's more what it is. We look back and we say there is a shared group, like a shared value system, a shared moral ethical code that really for the most part lined up with Christianity because everybody that was part of this at the time really for the most part were part of being a Christian. And it really was just kind of a do's and don'ts from the Bible. All right, like as a society, we agreed uh, that we probably shouldn't kill people. We probably shouldn't steal. We shouldn't, we shouldn't sleep with somebody else's spouse. We shouldn't, like there was all these things, and everyone just kind of agreed upon this. All right, and that was the framework that everybody lived by. So in this world, being a Christian wasn't hard, because even if people didn't agree with you about God or how to specifically worship him, they agreed with you on about 95% of everything else that you believed in because of the shared values that everybody had. So we go along, and, and things were easy for people, and living your Christian life really didn't ruffle any feathers. Now, over the years, things began to change. Less people in our country consider themselves Christians, uh, but for the most part, we still held on to a lot of those same moral beliefs, those Christian beliefs. But then when less and less people were Christians, they, they started to ask, well, why do we believe that? Why, why do we think that that's how we should do this? And this started to change things kind of in our country a little bit. People are like, you know, I think that there's a different way that I can live my life by a different set of values, and I might be equally happy. And things began to shift little by little, and th this is natural. And when you change directions a little bit, over a long period of time, that makes a pretty major difference. All right, now, I think that Christians would have or should have noticed the difference sooner, but the reality is I actually think that as, as culture was shifting away, I actually think that Christianity was also shifting away a little bit from where we should have been. And slowly over time, we didn't notice this as much. And really, it became that being a Christian was more synonymous with where you were sitting at 9.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning than the way that you lived your life the other six days of the week. And that's why when we read through things in the gospel, we read through things in Acts, and we think, well, why don't we look like this? Why doesn't our community look like this? We have slowly kind of shifted away from a lot of this. And I think that it wasn't until there were some more uh, blatant moral kind of guidelines that started getting blurred in our society that people started to have friction with the world around them. You would probably say now that over the last 10, 20, 30 years that being a Christian is more difficult and, and causes more friction with people around you than it did 50, 60 years ago, right? I think most of us would agree with that statement. In the first century, almost everything about Christianity and following Jesus was countercultural. The ways that Jesus was calling them to live was so different from what anybody would naturally do even to an extent for Jewish people. Like the Jewish people had slowly started to drift away from the heart of following God, which uh, they became very focused on rules and behavior. And that's why Jesus had so much confrontation with the Pharisees. But even more so, when you compare Christianity and the Roman culture or any society that they were part of, right? Like at that time, if, if you were seen as a victim or weak, like, that wasn't something where you felt compelled to help somebody who was a victim. If somebody else was weak, you didn't come and stand by them. If someone else was weak, you took advantage of them. This was just agreed on. Everyone was okay with that. That's how society was. And then Christianity comes in and starts to say other things. Like, no, you should, you should look out for the widow and for the orphan. You should do something about that. So Paul's traveling around the Roman Empire preaching this new way to live and it comes under fire often. The way he says you should live is so foreign to the people that he's speaking to. 
like praying for your enemies, sitting at a table with people different from you, saying that you are equal in God's eyes, selling things and giving the money to people who didn't have enough. Like if you didn't have enough, you were weaker, and it was probably because the gods didn't like you. You did something wrong to make the gods mad. Why should I help you out? This is your problem. It wasn't something that they felt they needed to correct. So Paul comes into Ephesus, the capital of magic. You know, they had just destroyed over $11 million worth of stuff. And this is the place where the temple of the goddess Artemis was there. Okay, and it is this massive, huge thing. Worship of her dominated the area. She was seen as one of the most powerful gods. Statues of her were everywhere, and they were made out of all sorts of materials. Archaeologists have dug these up. They have different statues of Artemis in all different materials. This is what they were, they were building this. They were shaping this. They were selling it. All right, so you can see this massive thing here. Now, they also have this theater that was huge where they met to discuss things. Okay, and it could seat up to like 24,000 people. About half the size of our TCF Bank Stadium at the U of M. Like, you, you can see these pictures. This is huge. This is a massive city with its own way of doing things. All right? And to the Romans, this gospel, this, this gospel way of living was subversive to the Roman way of life. And it, it is labeled as a dangerous social revolution. So Paul comes on the scene. And he makes a little bit of a ruckus by preaching about Jesus and how he's the only king. And some of the local leaders start to push back. And you can imagine, in a city like that, with, with that type of a, a massive temple, that type of a theater, like all of their economy surrounds these things. And Paul comes in preaching something else. People push back. And, and what was happening is that Paul was preaching, what they said was he is invalidating our way of life. He said that gods made by hands weren't gods. And this Demetrius takes issue with that, mainly because this is his livelihood. He is making statues of Artemis out of silver, and he's selling them. That's his job. And when Paul comes in and starts preaching that is worthless, he is losing his job. And back in this day, you don't just go down the street and find another job. You have trained in this job, in this work, for years. This is what you do. He has perfected this craft that Paul is calling worthless. And this hits him and his identity as a silversmith uh, and his financial livelihood. So he is going to do something about it. But he needs, he needs more than just the other people that are making gods. So really he tacks on there. Not only are they hurting us financially, but he starts saying they're coming against our goddess. And he kind of throws this out there to get everybody involved with him. Okay, and this throws people in an uproar. All right, it would be like going down the road to Sock Center and saying, Sinclair Lewis sucks. He's the worst. I can't stand him. He's awful. They're the main streeters. They're like all about Sinclair Lewis. You go to Little Falls and you're like, Charles Lindbergh? Yeah, no big deal. I didn't really like him. Not a good guy. I mean, he actually, Little Falls talked a lot about Charles Lindbergh. I didn't know this until after I left Little Falls. I thought Charles Lindbergh was like, it was like Tom Hanks, Brad Pitt, Charles Lindbergh. Like, they're all super famous, right? No one else knows who he is. And we conveniently skip over the fact that he was kind of a Nazi sympathizer and all these different things. Like, if you go in somewhere and you're like, hey, you know that person that you love that is like your hero? They're terrible. They're awful. That, that's kind of what, what Paul, in a sense, is doing here. And this throws people in an uproar because you have now insulted their way of life. And they grab some of Paul's companions, and the crowd grows as they walk down the street, and they are just shouting, and they are shouting. And it swells, and they head to this massive theater, and people are shouting, and they paint this picture that they don't actually even know what they're shouting about anymore. Right? Like, if you walk downtown on a day that the Vikings are playing, and, and you're just like chanting skull, and you're cheering for the Vikings, and, but you had a different alternative motive in this as you get somewhere, people are just going to join in with you. You walk by a bar, there's all these people coming out. Yeah, Vikings, let's go. We're walking to the stadium. And this is kind of what happens. And they get there and people don't even know what's going on. They're confused about it. 
And, and Demetrius is just trying to push, push this over the edge and say, we need to get rid of these guys. Isn't that so similar to today? People just start shouting. Pretty soon you don't even know why you're shouting. You've been arguing with someone on Facebook. 15 minutes later, you don't even remember what it started over. And you're just screaming and yelling. And that's like, this is, this is our world. Now at this point, the Jewish people in the city, they wanted to do something about this. But this was very self-serving. In first century, it was pretty well known that Jewish people, they weren't going to worship other gods. They had one god. Everybody knew that about them. They were okay with it because it was this small group. Jewish people were not looking for other people to become Jewish. So you weren't going to lose anybody. They're like, okay, there's that group over there, and they, they just worship their one God. They aren't going to buy our statues of Artemis. They aren't going to go to the temple. They aren't going to pay their tax there. They aren't going to do this. That's okay. It's that little group. Well, basically what happens here is, have you ever kind of had special favor in a situation? Then all of a sudden someone else notices it, and they come in, and they start wanting that same special favor. And you're like, knock it off. You're going to ruin it for me. And they're like, well, this person over there, they get to do that. You're like, great. Now no one gets to do that. This is what's basically going through the minds of the Jews right here. And they, they see this, and they see them pushing back, saying, you know, oh, Paul doesn't want to have to buy things. He's saying people don't buy those statues. They're going to ruin our special status. So they take a guy, and they put him forward, basically to be like, hey, let them know we're different from them. Don't lump us in together. And their guy gets up there, and everyone in the room finds out he's Jewish, and they're like, no, get out of here. And they just kind of push them aside. All right, and then finally the city official comes forward to quiet the crowds down and he speaks. And he starts talking about Artemis and how her image came down from heaven, which seems weird to us. It's, there, there's some historians that have looked and it looks like there's actually, there was a meteorite that landed close to Ephesus in the, in the near past. And basically they went out and saw this meteorite and they're like, it's the god, goddess Artemis. It's her image. I mean, she must have been a kind of homely looking god, I guess. It's a meteor, right? But they like put that out there and they're like, see, this, she fell from heaven. No one can argue with this fact. And then he starts talking about Paul and he says, hey, these guys actually, they haven't done anything wrong. They haven't robbed our temple. They haven't explicitly spoken against our God in a way that would be blasphemous. If the silversmiths have an actual complaint, they can take them to court. Otherwise, you need to calm down because what's going to happen here is we have a riot and the Romans are going to find out about this and we're all going to be in trouble. They put riots down with a sword. So they aren't going to care why we're rioting. We need to just calm down here. And he, he, he calms everyone down, disperses the crowd. It's quite the culture clash. If it weren't for this city official, who knows what would have happened. But, but none of this surprises Paul. The message of the gospel is absolutely countercultural. And understand this is why we say that the gospel isn't just, you know, God is good, you are bad, Jesus died, believe and ask for forgiveness, that's it. That, that's not the gospel. That's part of the gospel. The gospel is so much more than that. Because that message there of just asking for forgiveness to some God, like that would not cause this much ruckus in the first century. There is more to it here. People don't get upset about that little message. All right, so, so here's what it is. If you are truly living out the message of the gospel, all right, this upside-down kingdom, this different way of living that Jesus and Paul were preaching, uh, it, it will affect the world around you. If you're truly living this out, it will affect the world around you. If you aren't affecting the world around you, you are not living out the gospel. That might sound harsh, but this, this is what we see when we look at Scripture. When we live this way, it will cause friction. Now, part of the problem today, though, is this. Too many people think that just because they are a Christian and they have friction in their life with the world around them, that it must be because of the gospel. All right, that, that's not the case always. Sometimes, not always. It's kind of a, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't a square. Right? Like Paul was having issues, but when it came down to it, the city officials said they, they, there really isn't anything that he's done wrong. He's pointing to Jesus. He's saying there's another way to live. 
He isn't attacking us. He isn't stealing from us. He isn't putting us down with his words. He is just pointing to another way to live. Too many of us today, we don't control our tongue. We don't think about what we are saying and how we are saying it. And we needlessly offend people. And then we sit there and cry victim like it's because I'm a Christian. No, it's because you're a jerk. (laughs) And you don't control what you say. They aren't mad at you because of Jesus. They're mad at you because of you. And just because we have truth doesn't mean that others have to listen to us. That's a really hard thing. When you're sitting there and you say, I have truth. I know what the answer is. I know what we should be doing. People don't have to listen to you. And just because you are saying something that is true doesn't mean that you're saying it in the right way. We did a whole series on this, I think last year, maybe it was two years ago already. We just called truth plus love. That's what scripture says. That we need to, we need to have both of those, truth and love. And I think we are called to conduct ourselves in a way that points people to God, both through the words and truth that we speak, but also in the manner in which we say it and the actions that surround it. Okay, you, you can't point to a loving God while screaming at somebody. It just doesn't work. I started today kind of talking about this idea of a, a Christian nation. You know, whether you believe that's how our, our country started or, or, or not, or you know, for me, I just kind of think like that there was this, this shared values that we had. I think we can all agree that we no longer are a Christian nation. Like, we, we probably shouldn't consider our country this. And I think a lot of people, especially, I mean, a lot of Christians, they see that as a negative. But I don't. I, I want to share with you a couple of reasons real quickly that I think why this isn't a negative. All right? Uh, I think there are things that this does for us that are beneficial for us. For one, I don't want people around the world looking at our country and what happens here and thinking that that is representative of Christianity. And you might think that doesn't happen. Uh, When Emily and I lived in Duluth, our neighbors, two doors down, were from Kuwait. They were devout Shia Muslims. We became really good friends with them. And I remember one of the first times we went over to their place and sat with them. We said, hey, so, you know, before you came, like, what what did you think about America? Like, well, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm like, all right, yeah, that's kind of how we branded ourselves in the 80s, so you got that. I said, okay, well, what did you think of Christianity? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Because actually what they said with America is they said sex, drugs, rock and roll, and Christianity. That's what they knew of America. And they lumped all of those together. Because when they defined Christianity, that's how they defined it. Come to find out as we talked more and more, they're like, you're the first people we've met that fill in the blank. Like, we lived our lives in a way that was very similar to the way that they lived theirs, morally. The more Christianity can distance itself from any culture that is not living in a way that that worships Jesus, like the better. We need to distance ourselves from that at times. All right? I think uh, another thing is this breaking away also helps because it really forces people to choose. Like, you can no longer just kind of walk the middle of the road. You have to choose. Am I going to live as a Christian, or am I going to live in a way that matches with our society? Because they aren't very similar anymore. And I think that's a good thing. For years, people said that uh, they were Christians, and I think they identified as that just because it, it was just a title to them. It was the status quo. It was the social norm. And I don't think that You know, these studies that come out and say, like, Christianity is shrinking. I don't think Christianity is shrinking. I think the people just, basically, it was no longer easy and normal to just consider yourself a Christian. It was more easy and normal to consider yourself nothing. So I don't think we actually lost a lot of Christians. I think we lost a lot of people that that were just Christian in name. And I think, in a way, it's good to make us kind of choose and, and realize where We are. It also will now make it so that Christianity is cause it's something that causes us to be set apart. 
We don't blend into the culture around us. This is always what God's people were supposed to do. You see that through the Bible, that we were called to be set apart. And lastly, I think as Christianity and culture pull away from each other, it will force Christians to build a stronger community with each other. Hopefully we can stop fighting over carpet color and song choices and small doctrinal differences and actually start to have a community with believers. Why don't you stand with me as we close? I think as, as a persecution, which let's be honest, we don't really have firsthand experience for the most part on what persecution is. We may say that we do, that we have people that kind of come against us because we're Christians. Uh, the reality is we, we really don't have much. But as persecution grows, each one of these things will actually grow as well. We will have to grow closer as a community. We will look more set apart from the world around us. We will have to choose, am I going to live this way or not? Like baptism, I don't think we realize this, baptism in that day, in the early church, you were not allowed to take communion with the church until you had been baptized. This was not a legalistic thing. This was a safety precaution. To get baptized is to go in front of everybody and say, I'm a Christian. And you lose your family, you lose your friends, people might start trying to kill you, now you can come in and, and you can take communion because otherwise there'd be people that would just sneak in and try and write down names like what, what Paul, you know, was doing back in his past life trying to arrest people. Be like, oh yeah, these, these people were all in there. They were taking communion together. Let's arrest them. Like as persecution rises, we will have to make a choice. Am I sold out on this or not? And this kind of like in the middle of the road, mediocre Christianity is going to continue to disappear. And I, for one, am actually kind of glad. I am. If we are living the way we've been called to live, we will, we will have friction with the world around us. The important thing is that the source of that friction is Jesus, not our arrogance or stupidity or brashness. I want to love people in a countercultural way. I want to give my money away in, in a countercultural way. I want to pursue God's kingdom over my own kingdom, over the kingdoms of this world. And I probably need to look at some of the areas of my life where I resemble the world too much. Areas where I have let a slight drift over time really pull me away from what I am called to. I need to be spending time reading his word, diving into the stories and teachings of Jesus so that I can actually understand what I am called to do and how I'm supposed to do it. And I can't let other external influences like politics push me to believe one way or the other or become too close to a culture that looks nothing like Jesus. If you want to kind of dive into like what, what does this look like? The book of Daniel, first six chapters of Daniel. It's all about this. It's called living life as an exile. It's when you're living your life in a country that is not your own. And that's a better mindset that we need to have. And they say you can basically either fight against it, you can almost be militant and, and fight against the culture. You can completely give in to the culture. Or there's a third way, the way of the exile, which is to walk this path where I'm going to live here. I'm going to worship my God. I'm going to be part of this world, but culture is not going to influence me. And there are some small little things where I should be able to just live in this world and probably not get upset about everything. But then there are moments where I need to make a stand. That's what the book of Daniel is. It's them finding that middle ground of how, how do I live in this world? And they actually were called to pray for, for the good of Babylon. And I think that's where we need to be. So here's the challenge. Stop and think about the culture that we live in. Think about what a typical person's life in our culture looks like. 
the goals they have, the things that they want to succeed in. Does your life look the same or different from that? And now you need to take a step back and, and then kind of process that. It, are those similarities actually bad? Or are they okay? And what areas do I probably need to look quite a bit different from the world around me? How do you find the balance in this? As Christians, we will be in opposition to our culture at times. But let's make sure our opposition is rooted in Christ and not just some pet passion that we have. When we live our life, let's live where the only thing that we can be accused of when people are pointing fingers is that we're just pointing to a different way of living. I want to just kind of close us in prayer. I want to challenge you. Jump into the book of Daniel. Read through Acts. Read through parts of these stories. We are called to look different. We have become too comfortable and too at home in the world around us. God, I pray this morning, Lord, for strength. God, for wisdom and discernment. For patience. For forgiveness for the people around us that have hurt us. God, these are things we are called to live in this type of a way. God, that we would be able to love people in a different way. God, that when people around us look at us, that they would see that we are set apart, that we are not the same, that there is something different about us. And God, forgive us for the many times where we fall short in this area. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just convict us. Even in the moment, if, if, if we are starting to, to just scream and holler about something, God, that we would take a step back. We would ask, is, is this where I need to make a stand? If it is, God, that we would do it in a way that is, is, is loving and directs people to you. If it isn't, that we would, we would let it go. God, I pray that as, as people in Long Prairie and the surrounding area, as they look at us, that they would see something different and that they would want that. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen.